Is God unjust? That's what we're going to find out today in Romans 9. I always knew there was going to be a time where the Bible got very difficult. And boy, here it is when we start talking about these deep things. But again, I keep trying to go through this of looking up words and reading it as it is. Can you just imagine getting this letter? I just can't even get over what the people who receive this letter must be thinking, because this is an amazing letter. Look at us now, 2,000 years later, we're still pouring over this letter, but it's just incredible. And him laying out this to the church, the church is starting to mature. I mean, one thing you see in the Bible is God gives his message to Adam and Eve. The language gets more and more complex to start changing how God can speak to us. And I think that's incredible in this whole piece is that it's like when you have a baby and you can't tell the baby about DNA or genetics. But as the baby gets older, you can say, well, you got your brown eyes from your dad. Oh, baby. You know, the kid is like, oh, okay, I got my brown eyes from my dad. Just I have my dad's brown eyes. But he still doesn't understand genetics. And then maybe when the kid is in high school, you start saying, well, there's something called genes and you have brown eyes because your father has brown eyes. The, the explanation is the same. It just gets deeper and more complex. And I think that that's where we're going is that throughout the entire Old Testament, we have heard what the problem is. We see what the problem is. Jesus comes, tells us what the problem is, and then solves the problem. The apostles go out and start making disciples, bringing people into the church. And now Paul is saying, okay, now you're ready for the big discussions. It got more complex. It got much more deep. Wouldn't you want to be a fly in the wall when Peter eventually reads this letter? I imagine he understood it perfectly because it makes sense into the things that Jesus was saying. There's nothing in here that Jesus didn't say. It just is a deeper explanation, like telling your kid you have brown eyes because your father has brown eyes, or now we're talking genetics, and that's where Paul is. He is ripping off the Band-Aid and telling us the deep truth of this, even though it's the same truth we've heard all along through the rest of the Gospels and Acts. He says he's speaking the truth of Christ and not lying, and his conscience bears with him because the Holy Spirit is inside of him. And he says that he has sorrow and anguish in his heart, that he would even be cut off from Christ for the sake of his brothers, his kinsmen, the Israelites, his fellow Jews, that he realizes now, just like all the things that Jesus was saying when he was on earth in his mission, you think you're doing the will of God, you are off track. You think that you're washing this cup in the ceremonial way is God's will, and it's not. He cares about what's in your heart, not what's in the outside of your cup. And now Paul realizes that all the things that he has done, the laws, the covenants, the things that he followed, were failing him. And he wished that he could give up his own faith if it could save his brothers and his kinsmen, his people. And he says that they were given the law and the worships and all the promises, the patriarchs, and everything was there was going to that point of Jesus Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So he kind of ends it in a finishing prayer. But he said, it's not that the word of God failed. This plan did not fail. I've heard people say that. Well, if God was so great, why did he set out this plan that ultimately failed? That you were going to go into the Garden of Eden? Fail. That you were going to live together in peace outside the Garden of Eden? fail, that you were going to be a people together with God, fail, that you, you can look at this as one failure after another. Does that mean that God failed? Does that mean his law and his covenants and all the things he gave people failed? And even the people who are descended from Israel, that'd be Jacob, are not all part of Israel. And not everyone who is a descendant of Abraham, even if there is offspring, are following in that same line. So it's not about being a child, he says, of the flesh. It's not about being a descendant of Abraham, being a descendant of Israel, Jacob. Jacob's uh, name was Israel. 
It instead is about being a child of God. The children of the promise are counted as offspring. So it's not a fleshly inheritance. It is an inheritance of belief that we are grafted in to the nation of Israel. We are grafted in to the people of God because we are people of the promise. And he said that part of the promise was when he said, Sarah's going to have a son. Rebecca is going to have a child that all these descendants are going to be there. And people believed in the promise of what God was creating. So it wasn't that God's plan failed. God's plan is working as expected. He made these promises. He fulfilled these promises all the way through the entire history, all along. So we're going back all the way through history. And it is because it's part of his plan. He even mentions that he says that Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. And you'd say, well, why did you hate Esau, but it was the fact that through God's plan, he knew that all of this had to happen through Jacob, not Esau, which was the older brother. The inheritance should have gone through the older brother. And in fact, Jacob was promised this. The problem with Jacob, which we'll get at in the future, is Jacob tried to do it in his own human way instead of doing it God's way. But he knew all along that this was going to be the path of God's repentance was through Jacob. When you read the commentaries about it, it's not hated in the hatred kind of word. God loves everybody. It is meaning for this inheritance, I hate this for you. (laughs) You I think it's like if my dad looked at me and said, I had always dreamed of a child who would be a great writer. I hate this for you because I realize that's not who you are not hating me. It's saying that this particular path is not for you. So I believe that that's correct. I mean, we know that God loves everybody. And so he just means in this case, I love this path for Jacob. I don't love this path for Esau. We'll get into that someday. (laughs) But you can see that basically this whole line, God is not failing through, through Jacob and then Moses and through this entire history of the, G- the Jewish people, this is not a failure. He's going to call his people his people. He is going to love them. He is going to put them in a place that he provided for them. He, they will be called sons of the living God. He is quoting all sorts of passages in here. In this particular case, this is Hosea. In this particular case, it's Hosea 2.23. All this peace that goes in through each step of the way is part of God's plan. God's plan did not fail, but instead the righteousness has gone through this line, has gone through God's will. Again, remember God works through the good for his will and has achieved righteousness through faith, not based on works, that's very clearly pointed out, but instead attained righteousness because of faith. And Israel tried to pursue righteousness, did not succeed in reaching the law because they could not. They tried to pursue it, not by faith, but by works. I'm going to wash that cup. I'm going to ritually wash my hands. I'm going to bring the right animal to sacrifice at the right time. I'm going to do the right things at the right time. And who would know this? Like I said, Paul the Pharisee, because the Pharisees were trying to follow every single iota. They were trying to earn their righteousness through works and not faith, and it caused them to stumble. Jesus even said that he was a stumbling stone to them. Peter writes, and Peter will write about that in one of his letters too. But Jesus said, you know, the stone that you threw away is going to become the cornerstone and will be a stumbling block to you. So he understood, oh gosh, that this went off track, but not because God went off track or God's plan went off track, but instead he brought it back on track by bringing it back to saying that you cannot attain righteousness through works, but instead through faith in raising his son from the dead. This is a very long explanation, but that ends Romans 9. And so what I'm going to meditate on is this plan of God through the entire thing. We're going to see it when we get to the Old Testament, but this plan is worked out from the very beginning. In John's gospel, it even says from the beginning, Jesus was there. And Jesus was set on this rescue mission for us. 
that's what I'm going to meditate on is how this plan has been in existence and is by no means any kind of failure. What I'm going to pray about is that God always helps me see the plan, I guess, when I find myself disappointed. There are things that we wish would happen to us. There are things that we hope will happen for us. All sorts of things that we pray about in our lives. And when it doesn't come true, we wonder why not. And the truth of the matter is, is that God is working his plan out. And we are a part of it. We are a part of this plan, every one of us. But this plan is meant to bring everybody in is meant to bring in the Gentiles, bring in the Jews, to no longer be a stumbling block for people, but instead allow them to gain that righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. And what I'm going to tell other people is the fact that we are not meant to earn our salvation through works, that people took this idea of trying to work our way into heaven to work our way into perfection the wrong way. All these actions, all these works that people did along the way, wasn't it. Abraham and Sarah gained righteousness because of their belief and their faith. Moses, angry, crabby guy who yelled at his people all the time, did the wrong thing, never got to see Israel, was held in regard because of his faithfulness, not because of his works. David, faithfulness. Every single step of the way, we see all these people who have failed and stumbled in very big ways in the Old Testament. And instead you say, well, why Why was Moses given to be in charge of people? Why was Jacob given to be in charge of people? He had two wives, went out against his brother. Why is he the guy who got the birthright? Because it's about faith and not works. All right. Well, I'm, I'm hoping just by doing small steps and doing these chapters one at a time, we will get through it and we'll understand what's going on. I hope you're enjoying this. I know some of this is a struggle. Again, I use the Logo software and that has helped me quite a bit. Logos is going to change their structure. So they're going to more of a subscription structure. So if you would find that an easier way of getting into some software that might help you with Bible studies, that might be the way to go. But it's Logo software, you can find it on the internet and decide if you are interested in getting more commentaries. I find this to be a nice way of reading commentaries because I can take a look at a single passage, see it in four different translations. I have eight commentaries sitting in front of me. So when I read each chapter, I can see what different people talk about. So it's complicated, particularly right now in Romans, but I'm finding Logo software to be particularly helpful. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope you enjoy this podcast and you can tell a friend about it too. Thanks so much.